Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today I am going to talk about why do people think the economy is bad. So this is something that I've talked a lot about on the channel, just this idea of, okay, so we have this economic data that's saying one thing, but when you go and talk to literally anybody, they're like, I feel pretty bad about the economy. I feel pretty sad about my job, about my ability to pay my bills. Um, and so this piece is going to dive into the five main reasons that I think that's happening. So I did not publish a newsletter last week. And the reason that I didn't was because I was finalizing my book. It'll be out in April 2024. It's officially in transmittal. This was the second draft. And then I'll get it back in copy and be able to make a few more adjustments because I have to knock it down about 20,000 words. Um, but when I first sent in the book, there was this, this strange sense of melancholy after I hit the email and I feel like I do most stuff alone, right? And I didn't expect anybody to come out and be like, yeah, like, let's go. And all my friends are very supportive. Everybody was really happy. But I had these expectations, I think, of a shaken world of like a very different before and after. I had been expecting things to feel different. I had been expecting to feel different for the sky to open up and the sun to beam a ray of light right into the middle of my forehead and a booming voice to say really good job and uh for fanfare and chorus and celebration but instead it was just me and moo my dog as always in this kitchen office living room bike workshop that i i do so much work in and i think when we finish something gigantic it's an end and when ends come like that i usually try to run because ends mean that things have gotten too close like one of my friends recently moved away. I lost a friend at the beginning of this year, and then I ruined a friendship at the beginning of this year. And I feel like when ends come like that, I have the tendency to run away. And I promise I have a point. I'm not just going to be like, here's some therapy. <laughs> Theory is, if you keep on running, roots never grow. If you stay mobile, nothing can ever catch you. If you leave things first, you can never get hurt. It will keep you safe. And this works until you get tired. One day running gets heavy. One day you don't know where to run anymore. See, when most people run from things, it's because they're living in two worlds at once. A world where things are good and beautiful and people love you. And a world where you are still afraid and worried and uncertain. This can coexist. The reason that I began this newsletter, this video, with this unnecessarily indulgent soliloquy, uh, thank you for listening, is because I've been thinking a lot about the economy and the continued false idea that many have that we are in a recession and how that shapes the economy, people feeling that way, and how bad it feels to tell people that we aren't in one, that things could be worse and actually you should be feeling good. So tell me, dear reader, why do you feel bad? And just saying that to people just feels wrong. Because two things can be true at the same time. The economy can be better than it ever has been. And we can continue to have this crushing inequality with people who are still struggling. And I think that there's five main drivers of this disparity. So Quantian did a really interesting thread on Twitter with all of this analysis and essentially came to the point that people are bummed out because mortgage rates are so high. The Fed has been raising rates and that's put upward pressure on mortgage rates. And so people are like, it's really expensive to get a home and to borrow money. I don't like that. And nobody's stoked about that. But I think that there's more than just like people are not happy that mortgage rates are high. And of course, like his analysis, if their analysis was very simple. But I think that the main reasons that people think the economy is bad is there's unintentional oblivion. There's outsized negativity. There's a lack of safety. There's crushing uncertainty. And then there's misallocation and mismeasurement. So within un unintentional oblivion, there's concerns and difficulty around finding an answer. What does it mean that inflation is falling? What do rate hikes mean? What if I can never own a home? And then there's outsized negativity. So extremely negative coverage of the economy by the media and other tabloidy vibes and monetized attachment ideologies. Sorry, I had to take my... <laughs> my hair down. And then there's a lack of safety. So learned disembodiment and broad worries over but not limited to rent skyrocketing, medical emergencies, home ownership, rising inequality, lack of social connection and corruption. There's also crushing uncertainty. So it might be mortgage rates, but it's probably more the uncertainty around mortgage rates. And then misallocation and mismeasurement. So the gap between BC funding and impact, the difference between stock market returns and company value and survey response skew. So within unintentional oblivion, this is the general idea that most people kind of know what's going on, but it's hard to pay attention to, and it's really convoluted. The economy is loud, and 
to be discussed more in the negative section and therefore all of this stuff is really overwhelming which creates a sort of mental checking out where it's like it's just too much to pay attention to so i'm just not going to and so as we all know we've had these world we've been in a world of sudden rate hikes where mortgages have more than doubled from three to seven percent we've had sky high inflation and confusion confusion over whether or not inflation has been falling and so of course people are going to feel bad for many home ownership is the only path to wealth so if all of a sudden you're completely priced out of the only way that you thought you were going to be able to make a lot of money the way that you could have stability you're going to feel bad but if you can't figure out why you feel bad that can suck a lot too. And so Will Stansel has been doing a really good job of explaining the difference between anecdotes and trends. And as he wrote in a tweet, there's a very, very important difference between telling someone that their personal experience is incorrect and telling someone that their understanding of a national scale trend is incorrect. If we are forced to accept everyone's subjective interpretations of the world as true, no matter how loosely it relates to their lived experience, we're pretty much living in Trumpland where everyone's knee-jerk beliefs are always indulged, no matter how contradictory or false. So the economy is good. The economy is good, right? Like the economy, it is. If you look at the data points that we use to measure the economy and anecdotes aren't data, but there's still people out there that have a personal experience that is not matching what we're saying about the economy. And of course, most people are wrong about most stuff. You know, the majority of Americans think the stock market is going to go down. It usually goes up. And this is tough to talk about. Some of the oblivion is based in the idea that the trend of the economy is strong even though it doesn't feel that way for everybody. And people sometimes don't know what's going on. So there's also this, as David Roberts describes, voters from both parties like the sound of the policies in the Inflation Reduction Act, but they don't know the Inflation Reduction Act exists, so they score Biden poorly on climate. Biden is doing what people want him to do, but they don't know that he's doing it. There is genuine unawareness, a little bit of confusion, and of course, existing barriers and actual economic pain. There's also this stuff from Will again. One thing that a lot of people seem con uh, kind of confused about, the reason we're seeing a lot of strikes in unionization is not because the economy is really bad for workers, but because it's good for workers in a way that has given them tons of new bargaining power. So many things that feel like they should be bad, like workers unionizing, is actually good. It's actually good that people are able to have power and part of the economy is strong enough for them to do this, which feels counterintuitive in so many ways, but allows workers to make demands. But then, of course, part of the reason that people don't know what's going on and why stuff is confusing is the media. I want this section to be all like frothy mouth, uh, mainstream media is bad, but I do think there's some stuff to say about coverage. So the Federal Reserve of San Francisco publishes a daily news sentiment, and as you can see in this chart that John Henley made comparing news sentiment and news, they move pretty much in lockstep. Um, news coverage has also been pretty negative and has tended to pull consumer sentiment down with it. For one example of how coverage can erode sentiment, Ben Carlson wrote an excellent post, Why I'm Not Worried About $1 Trillion in Credit Card Debt, in response to the sometimes pretty scary headlines about consumer debt. There is always going to be households who rack up unsustainable levels of credit card debt, regardless of the economic environment, but right now things look pretty good as far as the collective consumer is concerned from a debt perspective. The credit card debt levels are not that bad, but if you looked up an average article talking about credit card debt, I would tell you that the world is going to snap from the amount of debt the average person has. The difference between delivering facts and delivering engagement. And then there's also money, making money from being a horrible person. Uh, Pearl Davis is a TikTok influencer who has built a platform on saying things like women shouldn't vote. Almost all of her views are offensive and like comically exacerbated. It's by design, right? The more that people yell at her, the more money she makes, the more attention she gets monetized dopamine hits driven by a reaction function. And to be clear, this is a phenomenon in Arabic. It's, um, it's called this. It means oppose and you'll get recognition, which is a person whose only ideology is the opposite of whoever they're talking to. Like they just exist to have beef with people. Markov wrote a really excellent thread about how ideologies eat you, writing these causes and judgments are not statements about reality, they are statements about groups of people and how they act or what they believe in aggregate slash average. This establishes friend and foe, folly and wisdom, and it sets the stage for people to engage. At this point, the original story and its message have been subsumed into the eternal pissing match that is public discourse. It has been recast in the familiar and stereo stereotypical archetypes that reify an ideology. By making it familiar, we are told what we should believe. Not for the truth because it gets lost in the cacophony. The problem is the cacophony, which is not how you say that word, matters much more than truth. The cacophony gets you paid. 
so lack of safety. So this one is really big, and it stems from general fears over the future that haunt pretty much every generation. The plans are eroding. There is often an unspoken expectation and idea plan of financial and psychological wealth built on home ownership. When those expectations, which are the root of reality, fall, it can feel devastating. For example, in the 1980s, the average home price was 4.5 times the median income. Now it's closer to 7.5 times. And then there's something with Gen Z humor, which I play into. I make these jokes a lot. But it sort of sets a broad atmosphere for that generation, which is concerning. So there's this Tumblr post, theology teacher, I have never met a human being who wishes they were not born. Entire class burst out into laughter. Gen Z culture is responding to, well, what if your mom aborted you with, I wish she did. And of course, it's just a joke. Don't take it so seriously, so many people say. But as um, a Twitter account points out, it's not just a joke. U.S. suicides amongst youths is at a 20-year high. Nihilism equals funny is sort of the defining characteristic of Gen Z humor, but sometimes that nihilism comes a little too close, catalyzed by social media, and the meme becomes reality, and all of a sudden you feel very alone. And I'm not a psychology person, although the economy certainly feels like I am sometimes, but there are so many weird things with how we interact with social media and each other. As Ali Taylor pointed out, learned disembodiment from being on screens probably doesn't help either. And we have lost a sense of community, which I've talked about a lot, a sense of collective responsibility, which deserves its own peace. And LV Workshop had a TikTok talking about this, explaining how American norms and values were broken during the pandemic. And that has shaped a lot of what we see today. And finally, the whole student loan debt thing. I made a TikTok about this yesterday, uh, but the headline of this Bloomberg article is the U.S. will have to write off billions in student debt due to deaths, which is like, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> around 300,000 people died over the past few years who still owe student loans, and that's roughly $5 billion in lost revenue for the government, but the phrasing of this, like, hey man, if you died, that's lost money for the government, is mechanical because it has to be, but the whole concept of it, educational debt is really absurd. It's a few points, you know, education in a good society should be for education. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but uh, it's something that we should encourage people to pursue for the sake of being educated. It's not fair to the student to force a huge financial burden onto them. It's not fair to taxpayers to eventually say, well, yikes, our students can't pay the massive amounts of debt and interest we have saddled them with. Not even death is an escape. Many parents had to co-sign for the loans. Colleges are responsible, too, for the costs that have become exorbitant. Trade jobs are widely available and should be pursued. And then the whole feeling weird thing. So there's also crushing uncertainty. There was a piece in The Atlantic that talks about what the best places in America had in common. And it's not just a lot of money. The, as they write, the lesson is that people seem to thrive not always in high salaries, but in health and life chances, when inequality is low, when land ownership is widespread, when social connection is high, and when corruption and violence are rare. Until these region virtues are shared nationwide, poverty and disadvantage will continue to haunt America. So the thing is, it might be that mortgage rates are causing people to feel bad about the economy, but it's probably more the uncertainty around mortgage rates, the building blocks of inequality, lack of ownership either of a land or home, lack of community, etc. stuff we already know. The final point I'm going to make is around misallocation and mismeasurement. A quick rant about venture capital, I think they owe the world an apology. So much incinerated capital, chasing returns over reality, it's just depressing. I understand the structure of the industry, I understand they need to make money, but there is a misallocation of capital to shiny bright new things versus foundational needs, and I think that they owe the younger generation a collective, I'm really sorry about that. And I think that, I, I whatever, but there is also weirdness around data measurement and divergence and vibes and reality. So the National Federation of Independent Businesses releases an optimism index and soft and hard data have diverged widely, mostly because it's pretty confusing to figure out what's going on in the economy. People feel bad, but things are okay. It just doesn't make sense. And I'm going to let this quote sit all alone because I think it speaks for itself. Nearly 60% of companies that have been public in the U.S. over the last century or so have failed to create value defined as earning total shareholder returns in excess of one month treasury bills. Finally, no one knows what's going on with the labor market. Anna Wong from Bloomberg published a thread on how maybe the labor market is weaker than it looks, highlighting that maybe the Phillips curve isn't dead. And again, maybe this economy is really, really weird. So final thoughts, how do we fix all this? 
Within unintentional oblivion, um, this will be one of my hottest takes, and I think it'll be one of my least popular, but I think we need to expedite Fed now. I think we need to offer people a centralized app where they can invest, save, and send money. I know people are like, but I'm important enough that the central bank wants to track all my movements, and I'm uncomfortable with that. And I implore you to think of a world where people have access to the tools that they need to make smart financial decisions and think beyond just yourself. In terms of outsized negativity, one cannot ask media to change their headlines for clicks or for people to not post engagement bait for dollars, but perhaps more conversations around media diet and discerning reality and someone just trying to rip a dollar out of your angry quote tweet. In terms of lack of safety and crushing uncertainty, this is all policy. This one's hard, um, and I think that student loans should be a conversation, and yes, you cannot want to pay people's loans, and still agree that it's pretty ridiculous what's going on here. Build more housing like Minneapolis and subsidize it and not freak out about fiscal deficits. To the point about student loans, I do not have any student loans. I was very lucky enough to get a full ride to school. I chose the school I went to because I was getting a full ride. I made a compromise. I still think that people should not be crushed under the weight of debt that they took out because they wanted to get an education and get a job. In terms of misallocation and mismeasurement, this one is also hard. Better data through better surveys. I understand that I'm you know, beating on this proverbial trash can in this video and saying, fix it, but these are just some ideas that people are hard working on and I'm just postulating. As an add-on, as Alex Williams said, the meme going around about using Taylor Swift to fix the economy is lame, but does touch on something real in, the, in my opinion. The economy desperately needs people to get better at throwing fun parties with good vibes. Finally, we have to recognize that two things can be true at once. The economy can be good, but that can be meaningless if people feel unsafe and uncertain and unsure. The poem that I'm sharing at the end of this newsletter is now one day a man went to work and on the way he met another man who having bought a loaf of Polish bread was heading back home where he came from and that's it more or less. This is also a podcast, newsletter, I'm on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, uh, X. Um, I hope that you all are doing okay. I don't talk to you soon.